So we're going to talk about things that I wish I could go back a year and a half ago and tell myself what to do and more importantly what not to do when deploying Wi-Fi 7 and more specifically why the 6 gigahertz spectrum because that's really what it's all about in my book. So let's start off with an icebreaker. What do these seven logos have in common? Somebody got it. These right now as of today are the only seven companies in North America authorized to act as an AFC working between the manufacturer and the FCC. So why is that important? Well, we have a new sheriff in town, right? The AFC, their role is basically to prevent you from causing harm like we've seen in 2.4 and even in 5 gigahertz, working with each other. You have your network, somebody else has their network, and their job is to play that mitigator in between using data from the FCC to say, hey, you can't do that even though you want to, we have to give you lower power, we have to prevent you from broadcasting and, and impeding what they call incumbents, people that have been in that space before. Okay, so gone are the days of just looking at Google Earth and knowing, yeah, there's somebody that's gonna be using DFS, I'm not gonna turn those channels on. It's not that easy. This is a partial list in North America about the incumbents that we're dealing with. And the one that I like to highlight when I give this presentation to other people is in that top right corner. Who knows where there's a Sirius XM uplink station by looking at Google Earth? You're not gonna know that information. The only people that have that information is the FCC, and their job is basically to prevent you from using spectrum that's gonna interfere with them. So, as an engineer, going through Wi-Fi design and deployments and helping customers build these networks from the ground up, we've come to realize, I personally have come to realize, I need to understand six gigahertz a heck of a lot better than I thought I did a year ago, okay? Let's break it down into the two models, right? We've all heard many talks through these last couple days about low power indoor and standard power, and it boils down to basically whether it's indoor or outdoor, but it's not the physical location. Okay, that's the key. I can't take an outdoor AP with a, with a waterproof case on it and put that in an indoor location and be fine, right? So if we're gonna run low power indoor, there's a certain list of criteria that we have to abide by per the FCC regulation. These five items have to be met 100% of the time. If they're not, one of those seven companies is your new best friend because they're gonna tell you what power you can and can't use in your physical environment. So how do we know where we are, whether we're indoor or outdoor, right? We've talked a lot, we've heard a lot about positioning, right? Currently today, February 2025, the only way the FCC has granted the use of location information is from GPS. So we know when we look at GPS in some of our multi-rise buildings, bunkers underneath the ground, there's significant limitations about getting GPS signal in there. So each manufacturer has to come up with a process by which they're going to provide locationing information to the AP, which can then go up to that AFC. Most manufacturers are working on, Ruckus is one of them, we have a solution using a mobile device where we set that root location. We saw some presentations earlier, I think maybe yesterday about using 11MC, right? That's what we do today because we don't have anything better yet. It's in development. But we set that anchor location. 11MC determines the rest of the APs in the environment. Once the locations are known with a fairly degree of certainty, that information goes up to the controller. The controller then forwards it to that AFC, one of those seven companies. FCC gets involved and says, hey, this is what you're dealing with at that physical latitude and longitude per AP. So think if you've got a deployment of three or 400 access points in your environment, you're getting a response on a per AP basis and per channel within that AP. Once that information comes down, each of those APs will then ingest that result and switch over to standard power if it was granted. And then your cell sizes increase, okay? 
So this is a partial list. If I put the whole thing up here, obviously you know how many channels are in six gigahertz that so you wouldn't be able to read it. I got rid of the 20 and 40 megahertz channels for the most part, so you could actually read what's going to be your response. If you were to go into the CLI of the AP and say, hey, get FC, you know, AFC response, this is what you're going to get. Okay? So what is all this? Right? OP class, that's going to be our channel bandwidth, 20, 40, so on. We have our CFI, which is our, channel, our center frequency identifier, channel number. And then what we're really after, what's my maximum EIRP that I can broadcast from that AP on that specific channel? That's what we're looking. That's what we're after. So let's overlay this onto the channel plan for 6 gigahertz. If you don't have this already, go ahead and screenshot it. We've got to thank Jim Palmer for creating this and, Jim, and, and Michael Corey. Um, you guys are... The, the mastermind behind this, this data speed, but it basically gives us our center frequency channels, all of our uh, bandwidth, and we're going to overlay three of those responses that we got from the AFC onto this chart and see what happens. So down in the bottom, you'll see those three. We picked them specifically, uh, 80 megahertz wide channel. For CFI number seven, we were given an EIRP of 28, right? If we take a look at the next one, we're at 133. Channel 23, right next door, we were only given 20 as our EIRP. Okay? So let's look, if I go up to 160 megahertz wide channel, what's going to happen? Let's use channel 15 as a combination of 7 and 23. And sure enough, my EIRP is going to be in the middle between what I was given on both of those. Because there's some incumbent that's blocking me somewhere in that spectrum. So we need to understand this. We need to know this. What are we looking for? 36, right? We always heard on standard power, 36 is the holy grail. That's where we want to go to. And I think there was another presentation that talked about the concession that was made from the FCC on low power indoor, where we're being given a net EIRP of 18 dB. That's really important. It's something that hasn't been done before, but it's to accommodate for that noise floor. So you can read about that in the, in the special note there at the bottom. But ultimately, this is what we're looking for. Right, that 36 dB of power. This is just a screenshot slide. It summarizes some of the spectrum and uh, considerations that we just talked about. Um, but let's move on into the actual clients. Right, we just heard some presentation about clients, how they're interacting with the network. This becomes extremely important. It's something I wish I would have known a long time ago when we're talking to customers and people that are adopting six gigahertz, because if they have the wrong client, it doesn't matter what we're going to do. If we're pushing to standard power and we're moving through and they have six XD clients on that network, they're never going to see it. It's not as simple as they can't connect to it. They physically will not see that beacon frame and they won't connect to it. So if you've got certain APs that are on low power indoor and certain APs that are on standard power, as they're roaming through that environment, you've just created a huge problem. Okay? Broadcasting your SSIDs in both spectrums, or all three spectrums in some cases, is a way to accommodate that, but it's not getting us the results we want with that six gigahertz allotment. There's a link at the bottom, uh, FCC website, put in the search criteria that you see below that, and you'll be able to get a list of all the FCC approved dual client devices. Those can run in low power and standard power mode. We can't forget about the actual wired part of the network as well. So when we look at the AP to switch ports, we've got to have multi-band, multi multi-gig ports. We can't forget about the PoE environment. And we're going through the, the fiber, making sure all of the uplinks are good. So what do we do now? Okay. Design, 6 gigahertz. Standard power is not the holy grail. It's not something that's going to be a miracle cure. It's going to solve all your problems. You've got to do your homework. You've got to plan. You've got to engineer it. If you're doing a replacement where you've got an existing APs today, you can't go through and just rip and replace it without doing a lot of pre-field work. You've got to do pre-deployment work. A safer solution, if you don't have the time or the equipment or whatever to do it, is a salt and pepper. You're going to go in and take out a few APs in key locations and then start to analyze that data that you're getting back from AFC in order to know how big you can go with your deployments over time. So with that, make your six gigahertz deployment a pet project, plan it, then engineer it, test it thoroughly, then implement it. QR code to my LinkedIn if you want more information or deep dive into this. This was a full hour presentation that was brought down into 10 minutes. 
Hit me up on LinkedIn. We'll go through the details. Thank you, guys.